On today's Winning Cures Everything, let's talk more about a potential ACC Pac-12 merger. Is there a school close to leaving the Pac-12? Uh, there's four teams being looked at for Pac-12 expansion. I mean, what in the world? Nick Saban, not happy about Alabama's potential three permanent rivals, and more. Can you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything, presented by BetUS, where we talk college football news and rumors all year round. I'm Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. This is the Saturday, March 4th edition of the show. It's season 8, episode 17. Yes, if you're watching, I know I need to shave. I'm going into my barber on Tuesday. I'm going to get it lined up correctly, etc. It's a mess right now, but it'll be better by Wednesday. As always, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, please go ahead and click that like button, uh, like a Polaroid, I guess. And whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, make sure and hit subscribe so you never miss the latest tales from the college football universe. Now, as you can see behind me, March Madness is upon us, my friends. College basketball conference tournaments have started up. We've got basketball on in the middle of weekdays already. And, uh, and while this is a college football show, I am going to be giving you guys my bracket picks uh, before the tournament and, and, and while I'm on vacation, really. Uh, so make sure that you're here for uh, all of that after Selection Sunday. Uh, I'm also hosting the BetUS College Basketball Show on Wednesday, March 8th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. It's 10 a.m. Central. Tune in over there, uh, see what picks mid-major Matt and Matty Cox from Three Man Weave have got for the day. I'll toss a link in the description so you can go ahead and get subscribed over there. It's the BetUS College Basketball Show. All right, now all that stuff's out of the way, it's time to talk college football. What is real about an ACC and Pac-12 potential merger? All right, I got a lot of questions, a lot of comments, ideas, etc. after discussing this on the last show, and, I mean, wouldn't you know it, it was a big topic of uh, discussion on The Big Suey with former ESPN president, current Moto Lark CEO John Skipper, and Nothing More's David Sampson. Uh, or excuse me, Nothing Personal. Uh, you can find their conversation over on the Dan Lebitard YouTube channel. I'll link it as well. Uh, but first off, Skipper started with this. I'm not certain that ESPN is not interested in being in the Pac-12 business. I know it's been reported, but I'm not certain that's true. Now, obviously, things get leaked for leverage from time to time, so this wouldn't be unprecedented. A source told Brett McMurphy that CBS is out of the Pac-12 negotiations, but Andrew Marshan reported yesterday, or I guess Thursday, that CBS might be interested in the top Pac-12 game of the week. So, who knows what to believe at this point, right? Now, along with the Pac-12 discussion, the ACC was brought up uh, with what happened at Florida State last week. Uh, Skipper continued... The ACC should expand or should merge with the Pac-12, which now has 10 teams. I would take eight of those teams, change my footprint, have a 24-team conference, which his math doesn't necessarily add up there, but either way, he said I would have a Western division and their ACC network footprint would expand to the West Coast. You could probably force a renegotiation with ESPN for a new deal, and you can solve both problems. The ACC would get more money, it would expand its footprint, and it can compete with the SEC and the Big Ten. So, that, of course, leads to the question of why and how this works for the ACC and ESPN, right? Like, why would the ACC stand to make more money by bringing in Pac-12 teams that are not apparently worth a whole lot to potential broadcast partners? Now, Skipper said that the ACC network has contracts with all of the uh, distributors that pay an in-conference fee, and they pay an out-of-conference fee based on states and it's not negotiable. Uh, he said that is enforceable, and suddenly all of those subscribers, and he said it's a declining universe, but it's still 15 million subscribers in that footprint, give or take, and they would suddenly be paying a couple of bucks a year for the ACC network. Now, I think that he means per month, not per year, but regardless, uh, he does make a very good point. The ACC network has 48 million subscribers right now. Uh, the SEC network opened with almost 90 million. Now, if you get the ACC network into... California, Oregon, Washington, etc. That's a lot of subscribers, and it's a home for all of the Pac-12 games 
that don't make their way over to ESPN or ESPN2. Now, David Sampson and the other hosts continue to ask questions about how the ACC network wouldn't go the same route as uh, the regional sports networks. And Skipper did have an answer. He said uh, it's because it's a national channel. He said it's still watched by most people in the footprint as opposed to 5 or 10% and because of the cloud of ESPN in negotiations. So then the other host, uh, who I believe is witty, if I'm not mistaken, he clarifies it with this. He said the way the ACC network works is if your state has an ACC school, the cable company has to pay more. So Comcast has to pay $2 for every subscriber as opposed to uh, in Oklahoma where there's not an ACC school, they pay $0.60 cents or whatever the case may be. So non-ACC states pay $0.60 cents or whatever for the ACC network if they can even carry it. And ACC states have to pay $2 per subscriber. So if you pay attention, the puzzle pieces are starting to fit here a little bit. Now remember uh, a few weeks ago when George Klyovkov was in Dallas uh, visiting with the brass at SMU? Now, I said on recent shows that the tonnage and the inventory stuff didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, Recruiting and market size for subscriber-based streaming services uh, didn't make sense for a smaller football program, even in Dallas, because they've got such a small share of the market. Like, wouldn't carriage for a network in the state of Texas be a much bigger deal than any of that? that? That's how this ACC network thing fits, along with them looking at SMU Potentially, right? So, remember, the ACC is in a situation where they've got some members, Clemson, Florida State, etc., that are really digging into the books, looking for any kind of loophole that is going to allow them to leave the ACC. Now, as it sits, the contract uh, is going to keep them $30 million or more behind SEC and Big Ten schools annually until at least 2036. And as we talked about last week, uh, Florida State's AD said it would be impossible for them to keep up with their peers at that rate. And by peers, we're assuming, you know, Florida, et cetera, uh, other nationally relevant programs in the SEC and the Big Ten. Uh, Now, let's not get it twisted. The ACC is secure. They've got their own network. It's it's an ironclad grant of rights. Their former commissioner, John Swafford, set them up with ESPN and ABC through 2036. Regardless of everything else, they are going to get a set amount to operate with And it's worth more than what the Pac-12 is rumored to be looking at and likely more than what the Big 12 is getting in their new TV deal. But the biggest brands, as I mentioned, are not happy. They're talking about changing the contracts to unequal revenue sharing so they can bring in more money, seeing as how they're actually worth more to the conference than these other schools. Uh, We know that that doesn't always work out for the best. I mean, I look up the history of the Big 12. Uh, So what can be done to keep everybody happy through 2036? Uh, Jim Williams, of course, the writer at Forbes and Zinger News, uh, he's been digging into this. I I recommend following him on Twitter, by the way, at JW Media DC, uh, to keep up with his latest stuff. Anyway, Jim's got an article over at Zinger.News right now, uh, and I'll have it linked in the description on YouTube. It sorts through, like, how this conversation started last summer. Uh, He says that not long after USC and UCLA left for the Big Ten, the ACC started going into, basically, protection mode. The rumors about Clemson and Florida State being unhappy about the upcoming financial gap were brought up back then. And if you watched my my last video, uh, you remember the conversation between North Carolina's AD and their chancellor about possibly merging with the Pac-12. Uh, the ACC commissioner, Jim Phillips, did meet with Pac-12 commissioner George Klyovkov to meet about the future of both conferences. And a couple of program executives from ESPN happened to be in on the meetings. Uh, And this was actually reported by SI's Pat Forty and Ross Dellinger. I mean, they broke the story back on July 6th of 2022. Uh, That article is titled, Sources, ACC Pac-12 Discussing ESPN TV Partnership After Big Ten's Moves. Now, it explained at the time that it wouldn't be a merger as much as it would just be a deal to get the Pac-12 on the ACC network, or or whatever name it takes on when it becomes more than that, uh, in which the network has exclusive rights to air Pac-12 games, to, you know, the West Coast through multiple ESPN cable providers. Uh, The deal between the Pac-12 and the ACC would be a media rights agreement and would likely take the place of the existing Pac-12 network. Uh, That is something to pay attention to. I mean, the Pac-12 does own their Tier 2 rights, etc., so something to watch out for. Regardless, Williams explains how the ACC network works in the article. Uh, Going back to what uh, Skipper talked about, the ACC network is a revenue share deal with both sides equal 50-50 partners, meaning... 
They boost ad prices for spots on Pac-12 games airing on the network, plus they get a monthly cable fee that could be boosted. Add to that putting some of the content on ESPN+, Plus, where, again, revenue can be shared. Uh, the network keeps the present contract intact, but can generate more cash with Premier Programming. Now, there are obviously hurdles here, uh, but there's a lot that could make sense for both the Pac-12 and the ACC. As John Oran mentioned on their podcast this week, there's still plenty of time to get a deal done. I mean, they, they've got a TV deal through this, this year. If you're a major university who's interested in maximum public visibility, you know, staying on linear television has to be a point of emphasis, and combining the ACC and Pac-12 would make sense uh, for both of those conferences. But are all schools confident that a deal is going to get done? Or are they more concerned with, you know, security right now? Uh, we'll go ahead and dive into that. But first, let me go on and tell you, Winning Cures Everything is brought to you by BetUS. With fast payouts, fantastic customer service, a myriad of options to bet on, and an easy-to-use layout, it's easy to see why it's been America's favorite online sports book for nearly 30 years. And right now, you can wager with a $50 free play with no deposit required just by signing up using the link in the description. So take advantage of the deal. Get signed up over at BetUS, where the game begins. All right. Is the Pac-12 going to stick together in its current form long enough for them to complete this deal? On the Marshand and Oran podcast on Wednesday, the guys only spent a couple of minutes on the Pac-12, but man, uh, what John Oran from the Sports Business Journal said at the end was incredibly juicy. He said, we saw how Apple dealt with MLS. That's a laborious process that takes months. The Pac-12, they really do have months. If all the colleges stick there, they have months to figure this out. The big question is, and what we're both sensing, is that there could be one that leaves. And once one leaves, all hell breaks loose. Now, rumors started flying on Thursday night that Utah is the team that is set to leave. Then it circulated on social media that Tracy Pearson, who covers UCLA, stated that Utah is headed to the Big 12. Now, other people uh, were hearing it, too. Other people have been talking about it. Pearson mentioned uh, there's talk about Colorado being a part of that, but Arizona State could be the partner that makes the Big 12 move with Utah. Now, if the Pac-12 deal that is brought to the universities is a streaming deal, or at least majority streaming deal, this would make absolute sense why some schools would want out, right? Utah has invested significantly into their football program, and it has paid off in a big, big way. Uh, from 1995 to 2005, after Urban Meyer took them to an undefeated season, etc., enrollment grew 7% from 29,012 students, um, or excuse me, grew 7% to 29,012 students. Uh, but if you look back from 2005 to 2021, which included a move from the Mountain West to the Pac-12, enrollment increased to 34,424%. Uh, I, am, I am way off on my words here. Uh, it increased to 34,424 students. That's nearly 19% growth. And enrollment of first-time freshmen was 5,361. It was the first time they ever had over 5,000 freshmen. Football helped pave the way for that. Now, if the school's football games are not visible, what happens to enrollment? Like, football is the front porch for a ton of universities. You could say the same thing about the University of Alabama. Student enrollment at Alabama climbed from 25,580 in 2007, the year that Saban was announced as the Crimson Tides uh, football coach, to more than 38,500 in just 10 years. That's over 50% growth from 2007 to 2017. Uh, so let, let's look at the potential partners. First, uh, Arizona State, they were one of the first ones that was rumored to be really irritated with Klyovkov and the fact that a deal had not been done yet. So it would make sense that, you know, they would be willing to split. Uh, they just brought in a new coach, right? Would they be willing to break apart from Arizona? Uh, I mean, we've seen it with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, Texas, Texas A&M, etc. Like, a lot of rivalries have been split up due to realignment. Uh, but, I, I mean, I am skeptical of it, obviously. Like, Pitt and West Virginia, one plays in the ACC and the other plays in the Big 12. Is what it is. Uh, they're not in state, though. Uh, Colorado left the Big 12 for the Pac-12 partially due to the Texas situation back in 2011. They joined the Pac-12 in 2012, uh, and part of that was due to the academic prowess of the Pac-12. But this version of that conference looks a whole lot different without USC and UCLA. Um, enrollment at, at CU has grown from 29,278 in 2012. That's their first year in the Pac-12. 
to 36,122 this year. The research dollars have gone up exponentially. A lot of that has been because of the company they keep in the conference. But Colorado has decided to invest heavily in football. The truth of the matter is you you do not bring in Deion Sanders if the football team uh, can only be seen through a streaming service, right? Like regardless of the payout you may get from Apple or Amazon or whatever, it, you want to make sure that your football program with primetime Neon Dion is seen on TV. Not to mention that Colorado has seemingly lax their transfer and admittance regulations so the football team can be competitive again. Like they've got to change things up with the transfer portal. Like in my opinion, this would be the most likely option. I know that the AD has said that Colorado's not leaving, but Utah and Colorado do appear to be the most invested in football right now. While it may be weird uh, to see a school go back to a conference that's already left in the past, it's not unprecedented. I mean, we watched UConn basketball rejoin the Big East. They left back in 2013. They just rejoined in 2020. Like, sometimes the grass isn't always greener, I, I, I suppose. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, I guess it's possible that Utah does just leave by themselves. Like the Holy War, BYU and Utah, uh, that would be a conference game. That would definitely be fun. And it would be another team in the mountain time zone that, you know, the Big 12 uh, is really trying to push out west, right? If schools are going to leave the Pac-12, it would appear that's likely going to happen sometime in the next six weeks. Uh, I, I would imagine that we are going to see something relatively soon on all of that. Just a guess. Just a guess. All right. On the other side... John Canzano has been told some different things regarding the Pac-12. Ross Dellinger has a list of the three permanent opponents for the SEC's potential nine-game schedule, and Nick Saban ain't happy about it. Uh, and ESPN wants to be a hub for all live sports. Let's check out some things you should know about. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, expert game analysis only on the BetUS TV College football channel. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. John Canzano. Noted Pac-12 insider. He is in Las Vegas for the Pac-12 Women's Basketball Tournament, and he spoke with a lot of sources about everything that's going on in the Pac-12. Now, I'm going to link his article in the description, but I thought it would be wise for us to go through some of this and, and just figure out what exactly it all means. Uh, Canzano learned that the Pac-12 Conference CEO group voted to approve further exploration of four universities for possible conference expansion. Now, we already knew about SMU and San Diego State, but it appears that Colorado State may be among the candidates, and nobody really knows who that fourth school may be. Like, we've, we've gone through options on the show before. Fresno State, Boise State, uh, Rice is apparently not an option, um, Tulane, et cetera. Like, all of these could be. Uh, but Kenzano has been told that UNLV is not a candidate, which is interesting to me. Like, if, if only because Las Vegas has literally become the Pac-12 hub, right? I mean, their conference basketball tournaments and, uh, and their championship game are there. Media Days is being hosted there, et cetera. And the information from Canzano was that the academic profile of the university apparently does not fit the objectives of the Pac-12 presidents and chancellors. So, uh, for those of you that think academics do not matter in these things, just take that with a grain of salt. It matters a lot to these presidents, and they're the ones that ultimately have to sign off on all this. So, uh, Canzano also does not expect Colorado to leave the Pac-12, as AD Rick George has stated that on the record. Obviously, it's not ultimately his decision, as I just said. Uh, it's the president's, but he's a key stakeholder in this. So, uh, here's the most interesting thing that Canzano put in his article here, uh, and I'm quoting, several Pac-12 sources say they are confident that the conference will match or beat the Big 12's announced $31.6 million uh, annual media rights distribution figure. On Friday, one well-placed conference source called being in the vicinity of that number a, quote, layup. One athletic director in Las Vegas this week for the women's tournament told me he won't be surprised when the Pac-12 beats the Big 12's number. 
Said this AD, we have better schools, better markets, and better ratings. Canzano said, I am regularly reminded that the Pac-12 also owns its own Tier 2 rights. Uh, The biggest question, will the conference be able to monetize the Pac-12 networks in a lucrative way? If so, they'll get into the $30 million-plus distribution range. If not, they won't. So let's tackle that a little bit. Uh, Being in the vicinity of the Big 12's number, like that's a layup. That kind of goes against everything that we've been hearing from every other person that's uh, that's tied into all this, unless like in the vicinity means within what five to six million dollars annually. And one AD saying, you know, we have better schools, better markets, better ratings. The ratings are are basically a wash. Uh, Washington and Oregon are undoubtedly the two biggest brands between the two conferences, but the Big Twelve got the market first as one of their teams was making a national championship game. And they're filling in the TV windows that the Big Ten, the ACC, and the SEC don't already. Uh, He also talked about Oregon. Uh, Canzano did. Quoting from the article, The University of Oregon is, quote, way on board with its commitment to the Pac-12 per a source with knowledge. That makes sense to me. The Big Ten isn't offering membership. The Big 12 makes zero sense for UO. Uh, The Ducks' primary objective is to make the college football playoff. And frankly, winning an automatic berth is easier in the Pac-12. Now, that does make sense to me, right? Oregon won't move until the Big Ten calls. So I, I don't think there's anything to worry with there. They're not going to the Big 12. Uh, just travel-wise, it doesn't make sense. All right, regarding why it's taking so long to get a deal done, uh, he was told one of the holdups on the Pac-12's media rights deal apparently relates to the involvement of Amazon and Apple as bidders per multiple sources. One or both is in play for a piece of the Pac-12's rights. The entities are relatively new in the space, and I'm told the negotiation has moved slower than expected because of that. Now, again, if Apple or Amazon is a significant part of this, you have to question, are all 10 teams fully invested in losing some of that visibility? Now, he reported that the Pac-12 CEO group has a board meeting scheduled on Tuesday, and then after that, it's like uh, subsequent meetings are going to be on the schedule every other week for a while. Like The Pac-12 narrative is obviously going to be different than the TV source the narratives, and, of course, I guess the Big 12 narrative. Um, but I'll give you something definite right now. Like, nobody knows what's really happening or is in anybody that does is not going to talk right now. Um, like, nobody nobody really knows what's going to happen at this point. I think it's just kind of up in the air. So I'm, I'm interested in all this. I feel like people have forgotten the, the fact that the Pac-12 owes $50 million to Comcast. Like, they're talking about this $30 million thing being a layup. How can you guarantee that? If it was going to be a layup, would this thing not already be done? Normally, you don't wait until the last minute to get these media rights deals done. Uh, But this this has been... If you're the Pac-12 and you could get this stuff over with sooner, I feel like you would. Like, it's, it's not a good idea to continue to sit here and just let people bash your conference. And, and make your own conference members, even if it's just one of them, make them feel unsafe or unsettled, right? I don't think that's a good idea. All right, quick reminder, uh, hit that like button. You know, it's the little uh, the thumbs up button. Uh, make sure that you are subscribed. So, of course, you don't miss anything like when I do shows on a freaking Saturday because the week got too full, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, hit subscribe, hit like, uh, tell your friends about it, all that good stuff. All right, Sports Illustrated's Ross Dellinger talked to Nick Saban about the SEC's future scheduling format. And we've talked about this on the show. It's either an eight-game conference schedule with one permanent rival and four rotating opponents, uh, home and away every two years, or it's a nine-game conference schedule with three permanent rivals and six rotating opponents, home and away every two years. That's widely rumored that the brands that have more trouble making bowl games would prefer to stick with an eight-game conference schedule so they can schedule four non-conference games, thus making the schedule a bit easier. Uh, The bigger brands, it was thought, were good with basically anything. But uh, Nick Saban basically said, hold up a minute, when he saw Alabama's proposed three permanent rivals. He told Dellinger, I've always been an advocate for playing more conference games, but if you play more games, I think you have to get the three fixed opponents uh, correct. He said, they're giving us Tennessee, Auburn, and LSU. I don't know how they come to that decision. Uh, Well, first off, like, those are Alabama's three biggest SEC rivals. Like, LSU most recently, but Auburn and Tennessee were always going to be on there. 
Uh, but I'll admit, like if they were looking for competitive balance along with regionality, like it would make more sense for Alabama to get Mississippi State every year uh, as there's only 82 miles between Tuscaloosa and Starkville. And to me, this screams that they're trying to make the permanent opponents as friendly for television as possible. Like they claimed in the article that it has to do with uh, a 10-year sample size. And if you look in that 10-year sample size, Tennessee is in the bottom half of the conference, right? So uh, the teams that are in the top half of the conference had to get two teams from that top half and then one team from the lower half. And Alabama's lower half just happened to be Tennessee. But this is not, like, Tennessee historically, like, just look at the past, like, 25 years as opposed to the last 10. And Tennessee is definitely a top half of the conference program. So I, I get it. Um, but let's, you know, if they're trying to do this as friendly for television as possible and then just trying to find excuses for everything else, I get it. Let, let's look at the numbers here for these three matchups. Uh, 2022, Alabama-Auburn or the Iron Bowl, had 6.27 million. In 21, it was 10.37. In 2020, it was 6.66. That's right, number of the beast. Uh, 2019, 11.43 million. And in 2018, 9.132 million. All right, now we move into the third Saturday in October, Alabama, Tennessee. This year, it did 11.56 million. In 2021, it was 4.68. In 2020, it was 4.36. In 2019, it was 4.25. And then in 2018, it was 4.305. Now, look at the LSU game, which is the one that I think everybody was kind of surprised by. The other two, obviously, Alabama's going to play Tennessee and Auburn, right? But LSU, 2022, 7.58 million. 2021, 5 million. 2020, 4.22. 2019, it did 16.64 million. And then in 2018, it did 11.543 million. Now, if you remember us talking about how the magic number for TV networks um, you know, it, it's 4 million. I'm sure you remember that, right? 4 million viewers, and that is a premier, premier spot. You can sell ridiculously ad or ridiculously high-priced ads for a game like that. Even during the COVID season in 2020, there is not a single matchup between Alabama and Auburn, Tennessee, or LSU that did less than 4.22 million. And, and that 4.22 was in the COVID season when LSU was putrid. Like, Alabama was up 45-14 to 14 at the half en route to a 55-17 to 17 win. Tennessee had been just meh every season until 2022, and the lowest number there was $4.25 million. Like, the averages for these games over the past five years, against Auburn, it's $8.77 million. Against Tennessee, it's $5.83 million. And against LSU, it's $9 million. So with this information, it is pretty obvious that the SEC believes uh, that they can get more money from ESPN because you don't move to nine games uh, if the games aren't worth more money. Like, if ESPN was going to stick with the status quo on the contract, uh, the SEC would not add that additional conference game just for the tradition of the rivalries. Like, when, when it comes to tradition these days, the only tradition any conference cares about is stuffing bags full of cash. Like, you don't do something extra to not make more money. It's not a smart business decision, uh, et cetera, right? So on top of Alabama catching LSU, Tennessee, and Auburn every season, Alabama's also set up to play two Power 5 non-conference games in each of the next 10 seasons, starting in 2025. Now, I'm going to go ahead and roll through all of them, uh, so get ready. In 25, it's at Florida State and host Wisconsin. 26, at West Virginia, host Florida State. 27, host West Virginia, at Ohio State. 28, host Ohio State, at Oklahoma State. 29, at Notre Dame, host Oklahoma State. 30, at Georgia Tech, host Notre Dame. 31, host Georgia Tech at Boston College. 32, host Arizona at Minnesota. In, in 2033, you're at Arizona and you host Minnesota. In 2034, you're at Virginia Tech and you host Boston College. Now, obviously, some of those are a little bit more difficult, but you add a nine-game conference schedule onto that, and you've got 11 Power 5 games with three of the historically strongest programs in the SEC every single year. Like, it's rough sledding. And one has to imagine that Alabama won't be this version of Alabama once Nick Saban decides to retire. Like, could he hang on until, you know, the Tide hosts Notre Dame in 2030? Like, who knows? Uh, regardless, if this does end up being the schedule, it, to me, it is quite obvious that the SEC is trying to maximize their TV value. 
Uh, Ross did post his potential guesses as to the three permanent opponents. Uh, rather than read through all of those, I'll just have it linked in the description on YouTube. Uh, but go and check it out. It's very interesting. Uh, it's a weird... It, how about this? It's not weird. It's different. And I think he's tied in enough that he knows what these are going to be. So, just throwing that out there. ESPN wants to be a hub for all live sports, and they are already talking with you know competitive media entities and major sports leagues in an effort to make it happen. Uh, in basic terms, ESPN would act as your live sports TV guide. Like even if the games are on CBS, Fox, NBC, etc., uh, you would you could still get to them from ESPN's app or their website. Like streaming services are reportedly more open to cooperation with competitors these days as their strategic focus is shifting away from subscriber volume growth to profitability. Uh, now, this is still in the talking stages, and nobody has agreed to anything yet. But in its simplest form, ESPN would link directly to uh, wherever the games are streaming, whether it's Amazon's Thursday night NFL football, Apple TV Plus for you know MLB Friday nights. You got your regional sports networks for uh, Major League Baseball, uh, the NBA and NHL, like, or to all the different networks that carry college football and basketball. Like, I would imagine they're probably going to connect to like Hulu Live. Disney is uh, is majority investor in Hulu. And this would solve some major issues, right? Sports fans uh, continue to be frustrated with trying to find games. There are so many different networks and streaming services and everything else. Uh, swapping between cable and streaming is just incredibly inconvenient. Uh, there's one possible model that's been discussed, um, and that would be, you know, would ESPN be taking a cut of subscription revenue from users who sign up for a streaming service through the ESPN site or app? Um, yeah, they would just supply a link uh, without taking a cut if the user's already subscribed, obviously. Uh, but personally, like, I hope this happens. I've got four TVs and five computer monitors in my man cave. You, you can see some of them behind me. Uh, but when I'm not here... Like, trying to find games is frustrating. Like, let, let me know what you guys think about this in the comments. I, I love the idea. I love the idea of this, just having one spot where all of the games are. Very easy. All right. Next week, we're going to hit on Georgia, all the stuff that's going on with the arrest, et cetera. Uh, there's some new members of the CFP committee, along with, you know, a ton more stuff that we'll hit. But that is going to wrap up today's Winning Cures Everything. If you have not already, go ahead and hit that like button. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Uh, jump in the comments with all your thoughts on everything we talked about today. Um, you know, make sure to get signed up at BetUS in time to join their $1 million perfect bracket pool and their $100,000 best bracket pool. And, of course, you know, make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast uh, and, and, you know, that you leave a nice review. I would certainly appreciate that. All right, as always, if there is something that you want me to talk about on the show, yeah, feel free to hit me up. I'm at GaryWCE on Twitter. Or you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Now, I hope you all have wonderful weekends. <laughs> what, what time is left, anyway? Uh, until next time, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, all your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.